Good morning, folks. Thank you, Lee. As Lee said, my name's Dave Mayers. I'm a surveyor from Sydney. I'm here this morning to talk a little bit about innovations, and what that actually is. So to me, innovation is simply about taking something that you have and making it better. In many cases, it could involve the application of technology or science to improve a current work process or procedure. I can think of many examples of how innovations have changed our lives within recent years. iPads, iPhones, iPods, the emergence of Facebook or Google, or even 12D. Even conducting your banking or shopping on your mobile phone is now a reality. I'd ask you all today if you would like to be considered more innovative, but I don't think I have to, because I know the answer. So following on this theme of innovation, I'd like to give you all a, a taste, if you like, of the innovations that we've made possible on the NSIU project and detail a few examples. Let's dive in. Okay, so a little bit of context about the project. It's one of four projects under the Freight Corridor Program. It's a federal and state government initiative and it's designed to improve the capacity and reliability of train services, both freight and passenger, between Sydney and Newcastle. The main aim of the NSIU project is to remove the need for freight trains travelling south from Newcastle to cross over onto commuter lines and blocking the system. The project's being delivered by Transport for New South Wales and an alliance between John Holland Group and Boyd Construction Australia. A design joint venture was, was put together by Sinclair Knight Mertz and Parsons Brinkerhoff with Mott MacDonald engaged as the tunnel designer. Just looking at the geographic location of North Strathfield, it's within the state of New South Wales and it's a suburb of Sydney's inner west. Unsurprisingly, this project involves a rail underpass. So the construction of the tunnel is, is what's called new Austrian tunnel method construction. I'll explain what that is shortly. Something to keep in mind is that we are tunnelling beneath live passenger railway lines and also a freight line. There are two key pro I'm sorry. <laughs> there are two key project requirements. These are that we need to be able to verify the, the thickness of shotcrete when we spray it, and we need to be able to do that when we're in the field. We also need to design and implement a automated monitoring system to protect the travelling public. So let's have a bit of a look at tunnel methodology. Here we are, this is our tunnel. As you can see, the tunnel is around about 148 metres long, which is not a great length as far as tunnels go. What you can see though, is that we're very shallow. This is driven by two pinch points, both north and south of the tunnel, which dictates the height of the tunnel. At position two, for most of the tunnel, we're about 3.5 metres beneath the underside of the ballast. However, at position one, on the western side of the tunnel, if I was standing on the crown of the tunnel, impossible though it might be, I could touch the ballast. So that's what we're dealing with here. This is a method predominantly used for shallow or soft soil tunnelling. And our tunnel designer, Ted Nye, has designed the tunnel specifically with an arched profile to ensure no flexure in the tunnel lining and that loads applied result in a lining purely in compression. The NSIU tunnel departs from the standard Natum style. 
which involves canopy tubes driven before the face. At various cross sections, we also apply a steel set around the arch of the, of the tunnel. However, we have opted not to do this and we apply shockcrete instead. The shockcrete is synthetic reinforced and sprayed directly onto the canopy tubes. The design thickness of 250 millimetres is critical and so we need an effective system of measurement. You can see here it's a key design requirement that we accurately verify this. It's also a key construction requirement that we do so in real time before we move on. So here's our problem. There are commercially available systems for this application. However, they are not real-time systems in the sense that they post-process results based on the difference between the layers. What you can see here in the picture is a comparison with a jagged surface, which is often the case with rock excavations. And it's not accurate enough for us, given our project requirements. Don't get me wrong, that's an interpretation of the thickness and it provides, the, the commercial systems provide the ability to scan the surface at a given interval. But the process does not allow for accurate point-to-point -point style comparisons around a circular arch. So, this is a real problem. Something that's not easily rectified. However, in November 2013, the NSRU and 12D Solutions entered into a beta test agreement with the primary goal to develop an effective system of thickness measurement and reporting on the fly. Added benefits to the development of the system was the ability to be able to control the alignment of canopy tube drilling and plotting results in the field in real time. For those of you who aren't familiar with 12D Field, we're running a full version of 12D, the very same one that you're running on your desktops, on daylight readable tablets, connected to survey instrumentation and automated through a Bluetooth connection. I've prepared a series of short videos detailing the construction process. And as best I can during the following sequence, I've tried to place you, the audience, in the box seat. That is from my perspective as a surveyor. You can see from the list of activities that the survey function is responsible for on the project. So let's dive in. Okay, so here you'll see a video of, of us drilling in some canopy tubes. You'll see there's a guide hole at the top which is preset out as is the canopy tube location. There's a prism, a small prism which we observe mounted on the back of the arm. You can see the operator here and as we pan back you can see the theodolite. The theodolite takes the measurement, relays it back to the tablet via Bluetooth connection, and this is a view from the operator. He's looking at real-time offsets there. That one was one mil. I don't know if it was feed income or not. The operator adjusts accordingly. All right, the next activity, excavation. Excavation is completed with a road header. Road header involves a rotating cutting head attached to an excavation extendable arm. We use third-party machine control software to guide the excavation to where it needs to be. Okay, next in the process, once we've finished the excavation, is the as-built scan. This time we're scanning to a design profile at an interval which the project has selected at 200 millimetres. You can see in this scan that we're, we're surveying between changes 112 and 113, and we're incrementing 0.5, so we'll get three scans out of this one, which means that the, the instrument will take three cross sections. Here we're setting our tolerances. In order to get verified point-to-point -point measurements, we'll need to be on chainage and on our profile we'll need to give it an offset. We want to be around about 20 mils. Okay, so the surveyor is now going to set up his 
his points to be recorded in the correct models. If we get our Forono game, we can have these recorded into models, which can be, which can be then used and archived as as we would hope. Okay, we're measuring now. The the tablet sent an instruction to the the theodolite. The theodolite is now measuring around the arc, arch. It's difficult to see because there's no light, but you can see the laser measurement there. And that's going to iterate until it finds the right location, until it finds the right chainage, and then it will move on to the next section, 200 millimetres away. We're not going to watch the whole thing, by the way. <laughs> Okay, so what you can see here is the, a close-up of the tablet. What you see there are real-time measurements. We're looking at the machine measuring in the arch. Laser measurement, reflectorless. Now that's relayed back to the tablet and it's shown in real time. You can see what you're doing, which is a, a vast improvement on previous softwares. Okay, now we've got this, the scans. We've got three pretty tight scans in chainage. We can create a tri-mesh, which would be the buzzword for this conference, I'm sure. From the points that we've surveyed, we'll be able to provide a pretty close approximation in between those, cross, those surveyed cross-sections. And also, points can be offset normal to that surface. It's not simply an up and down like tins used to be. It's a pretty simple process to uh, create a tri-mesh. We do so in the field while we're doing the scans. And we're just going to have a bit of a look at that now. Okay, so as we saw, the points are scanned at 200 millimetre centres around the arch. And on a, good day, on a good day, we'll get, uh, we'll get between two and 300 millimetres between cross-sections. Okay, that's it. We've now got a three-dimensional surface that we can offset in between cross-sections. It's used as a basis for thickness measurement. I should also point out that TriMesh is not used for primary quality verification, but it is used extensively during the construction process. So after the as-built scan, the creation of a 3D tri-mesh, so, sorry, uh, we, we use the 3D, sorry, I'll come back here. Uh, we apply shockcrete. On the project, we apply shockcrete in two separate applications. The first one goes on at around about 100 millimetres, 100, 150. And here's some footage of that happening. It's a little bit like watching grass grow. After this process, we need to know how much more shotcrete we need to apply. So we use trimesh for that. What we're doing here is we're going to select the trimesh, which is the same that we saw surveyed before. OK, so the surveyor will then Select his measurement type, which is going to be reflectless, laser. And now we're measuring. There's the reading. Try mesh offset, offset 90 millimetres. We had sprayed 90 millimetres of shockcrete on that. This is the sequence. We've got a man in an EWP there. The surveyor will read what the difference is between the 250 minimum. Depth gauges will be installed accordingly. This is a vast imp vastly better than previous, the previous process. Okay, now we've got the shock read on. 
We need to do a verification of that Schrock Creek for quality purposes. It's got to be proven to be more than the design minimum. Otherwise, we've got to go and apply more, which will hinder the process. A 12D field is used to determine the thickness by point-to-point -point comparison, which is the only way to measure this. The key to its accuracy, as you can see, is the ability to iterate and record points which are normal to those that were already recorded on the underlying layer. We're going to look for the same change and the same offset around the profile and record that, which will give us a point-to-point -point measurement. Once we've got those, the ability to be able to plot these in the field for sign-off by responsible engineers is here. This improves, this improves the effectiveness of the survey function and also the, the cycle times. The second innovation that we needed to, to conduct on the project was the implementation and design of an automated system. An automated system to monitor what's going on on the track with the tunnel being driven underneath. So our stakeholder requirements dictated that we were required to measure four key rail parameters that were included in their maintenance specifications. In effect, the measurements that we are taking needed to emulate those taken in the traditional method with CANT boards by a track certifier. The four key parameters are shown here, short twist, long twist, top and line all reported over differing, differing baselines and all measured at two metre stations or intervals. In addition to this, any report that was created needed to be produced in both numerical and graphical format, so at a glance, trends can be identified and treated. Let's have a bit of a look at what is, we're actually hoping to achieve here. Short and long twist are in effect the difference between track elevation, or cant as it's known, whereas top and line measurements are in effect the measurement of the mid-ordinate deviation over a baseline in vertical and horizontal profiles. So here is our problem. There is no off-the-shelf solution for an application such as this, given the unique project requirements. There's some 330 train movements through the monitoring area each day and that's very difficult to predict. These trains, when running on ballasted tracks, may cause apparent deformation when the track is under load. How do we solve that? The alarming levels are set at different values for each of the three tracks that we're monitoring, depending on track speeds and geometry, each of which is different. And lastly, at two metre stations across three tracks, we've in excess of 380 odd targets to be measured, calculations performed, Alarms checked, which I think you'll agree is no mean feat. For a bit of context, I have a short video here showing the monitoring area heading from north to south, which is, which is the direction of the tunnelling underneath. Let's have a look. Now, as you can see, we've just pulled into North Strathfield station. We've got the down main and the down relief here and we're travelling on the up main. We're heading south. Okay, as we pull away from the station, uh, you can see on the left hand side the northern tunnel portal, which is where the tunnel starts. And it heads across at a 45 degree angle from here. We'll stop a bit further up and you can see the track monitoring infrastructure. All the white prisms, all attached to the rail foot. Here we have a staunchion with a total station mount. There are two subsequent mounts to give us enough coverage. And lastly, the southern portal. This is a big problem. Our solution has three main components. 
they are management component, hardware, how we get the measurements, and the software, how we produce the report. As part of our management solution, we've, we've, broken, the, we've broken the monitoring down into sizable portions that we can use. They're 20 metres in length, and that seemed like a reasonable figure to us. And yeah, as I said before, all the targets are placed on the eastern flange of the rail. By having these zones, we could link them to the construction activities. The most suitable linkage here with NATAM type tunnelling is the insertion of canopy tubes ahead of the face. So each time we're placing a canopy tube, we're also making a decision on how those zones are going to react and what needs to be if we need to get more measurements in a certain zone or whether we need to get less measurements in a certain zone. Once the relationship is built, that zone could be in one of three phases. It could be in a baselining phase, it could be in active measurement phase, or we could be closing it out. Okay, so we've also got a, had to deal with a, a conceptual element here, which is... You know, everyone wants information in real time. However, as you can appreciate with, with, with this type of monitoring, these are all relative measurements, so it's simply impossible. We need to have a data set first before we can then do our calculations and produce our reports. So what we offered was the ability to, to get single point deformations just as, as soon as we measure it. We can, we can report if that's above a certain limit. And what we would do with the four key rail parameters is we would collect those, that information over uh, each hour and produce a report and alarm that accordingly. Here's our workflow. Gee, it's busy. You can see here that we've got theodolites, total stations in the field to collect our measurements. We, we had a look and found some software that was the most suitable, even though it didn't, didn't do everything we needed, for this purpose, and that software was Leica's GMOS software. The, the back end of the, the software is actually a Microsoft SQL database, and this is actually the point at which we, we realised that, hey, you know, we can do some, some innovation here. This PowerShell process, shown down in the bottom right-hand corner, is where all the innovation happens. Basically, we take data out of the database, we run an SQL query, that does our calculations, and you know, we can produce a report accordingly. Sounds easy. So, the GMOS monitor software, it could control the theodolites remotely. It can, we can put various points into, into various different, different groups. We can program sequences calculate deviations in real time and alarm them. It was perfect. The most important part here, it can schedule and run batch files. Here's an example of the, the infrastructure we saw on the rail before. This is a target that's, that's actually been glued to the rail. We weren't allowed to, weren't allowed to drill into sleepers or, or certainly weren't allowed to drill into rail, so this is what we came up with. We lost none of these targets, which was, which was I think what an achievement. The reporting process, okay, so um, as I said before, the SQL query do does all the hard work. It takes the data out of the database, produces an XML file. That XML file is run through a style sheet to produce our HTML file. And during the process on the way, we've got a clever way to produce a graph, a graphical format. The data is then run through a, a free piece of software called GNU Plot, which will, which will give us a a picture which we can attach to a HTML report. So here's our solution, the final deliverable we came up with, which is produced every hour across all three tracks. Numerical format of all of our, our measurements. With our tolerances and our graphical formats. I've got a hell of a lot of these uninteresting reports. <laughs>